Morning, everybody, and welcome to today's cabinet meeting. Apologies for the delay this morning. We've been outside marking uh, Armed Forces Week, so we've been flying the flag, and pleased to say the whole cabinet was able to do it uh, today. So I'd like to welcome members, uh, those in the public gallery, although I don't seem to see any at the moment, and those watching the live stream this morning. So before we begin, in the event of an evacuation alarm sounding, everyone should vacate the building through the nearest exit and proceed directly to the assembly point. So we'll kick off this morning with item one, as ever. Apologies for absence, Pippa. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we have apologies from Councillor Coles and Councillor Bisbee, and also from Sue Grace and Jyoti Attree, and we have Amelia Watkins here, or Emmeline Watkins here as a substitute. Uh, thank you very much. I should also say it uh, makes a change to be back in the council chamber. Um, <laughs> it's like we're all very close, uh, which um, I'm, I'm sure we'll manage. So um, our item two, are there any declarations of interest from members this morning? No, that's good. We'll proceed. So, uh, minutes of the shareholder cabinet committee is item three. That was held on the 15th of December 2021 and the cabinet meeting on the 19th of April 2022. Are the minutes agreed as a true and accurate record? Do I have a proposer and a seconder? Don't all jump at once. Lynn Ayres, thank you very much. A seconder for those? Oh, Steve. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Steve Allen, there we go, Pippa, thanks. Now, are there any petitions to be presented to Cabinet this morning uh, at item number four? Nope, appears not. Okay, thank you very much. I thought Steve was going on a walkabout for a moment. <laughs> just grown a bunch of papers which there are spare copies okay so we will move on to item number five which is the interim report of the task and finish group to examine the issues with car cruising in peterborough you'll find those um that report on pages 11 to 34 of today's agenda pack uh steve allen may want to introduce this but i understand that ian phillips will be addressing the report and i believe councillor hogg uh, as chair of the finish task and finish group, I think it was, is also in attendance as well. So, Steve, do you want to kick this off? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Leader. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you've stated, this is the interim report of the task and finish group to examine, examine the issue with car cruising. Uh, the recommendations uh, 1 to 10 on page 11 of the agenda paper. Uh, and we are seeking endorsement of the recommendations proposed by the Communities uh, Scrutiny Committee. And this is to address the uh, unauthorised car meets in Peterborough and uh, the impact of antisocial use of vehicles um, uh, to the detriment of residents' amenities. Uh, thank you. Uh, as, as the leader has pointed out, uh, we have Ian Phillips and I believe Councillor Hogg to take any questions. Off and on. So, um, Ian, do you want to pick up? Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, very pleased to be here with Councillor Hogg, who's been part of our cross party task and finish group that's been looking at the issues around car cruising uh, in, in Peterborough. It, it, it's fair to say it. it car cruising causes a, a significant problem for a, a number of different communities uh, throughout Peterborough, and we've had a, a very um, thorough review of the issues. We've been speaking to residents to get their views. Councillor Hogg and, uh, and other councillors have spoken to businesses to understand what impact it has on them. And we've also been working closely with the police to see what they can do in terms of enforcement and, and prevention. Uh, this is a report of the task and finish group rather than officer report. So Councillor Hogg, perhaps I could ask you to, um, to present your, on behalf of the group, your, your council's report. Okay, thank you. Just to clear up, I'm not, I'm not the chair of the uh, of the group. Uh, the chair, the chair um, uh, is uh, well, was um, Councillor Howell is now Councillor Stevenson, um, but um, because of her, her change in circumstances, um, I believe is no longer uh, able to be on the task and finish group. In fact, we've had um, quite a number of people leave the group in the in the, the time that the, the the group has been in existence. Um, so, uh, you know, the, um, the report was, was, was put before um, the relevant committee 
Um, in fact, I was um, the person asked to, to, to present at that, that on that occasion as well. Um, I, this is just a, an interim um, report. Um, it, it, it's safe to say that this, this has been a very long-winded process. Um, uh, and you know that there is a number of complications involved in uh, in tackling this issue. Like I suppose most um, the, the task and finish groups have to um, have to look at. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that that, that Peterborough has, has, has been um, is now seen uh, across the community, the car cruising community, as being a soft option. Um, we, we we seem to have a lot of um, meets with huge numbers of uh, attendees coming from far and wide. Um, I think that's possibly due to the fact that um, maybe in their locality, um, they're getting a much more robust approach to their activities. Um, whereas in Peterborough, they seem to be um, kind of almost left to it. Um, and I think it's now got to a, a, an unmanageable state, um, specifically the um, uh, the, the kind of the, the secondary um, aspect to car cruising, which is the uh, um, drifting um, that happens around Stapleton Road, um, and you know, as you see in the report, there, there are um, moves afoot to get some um, traffic calming put on that uh, estate, um, which you know will certainly alleviate the situation. Um, but whether or not that that is uh, a panacea is 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 to be. Uh, it's to be seen. Um, I, I suspect that it, it might mean that, it, that there is a certain amount of dispersal. So I think you know the work is still needs. To, there's still plenty of work that needs to be done uh, in tackling this. Um, thank you, Councillor Hogg. So members, I'm sure there are a number of questions, and I'll kick off with John Howard first. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, you've said that the task and finish group have, have spoken to residents, which is really good to hear, but what were their views on how car cruising affects them? So as I said, there's sort of two elements to this. There's the, the sort of static meets, um, which aren't necessarily hugely static in the fact that people do tend to sort of drive around. Um, there's a huge amount of noise created by these, these cars. Um, a lot of them have got modified um, what they call mappings, uh, of their engines that uh, produce pops and bangs, um, the sound is very akin to, to that of a gun range. Uh, very, very loud indeed. Um, and specifically in, in, in my ward, and the, the, um, what they call the Apex Car Park, which we, we, we call uh, Pleasure Fair Meadow Car Park, um, you're, getting car, you're getting sort of 500 cars um, in, in, and that they're coming and going. Um, they, they're, going up and down the lanes etc a huge amount of noise is is generated um from this and then there's there's loud um in car uh, entertainment stereos as well uh, adding to that mix um and then also the, the kind of the burning of rubber where there's huge plumes of smoke that goes up um the second element to 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 to, to that is uh, the stapleton road um uh, venue where they do a lot of drifting um, and that can go into the early, early hours of the morning. Um, again, as I said, there's a huge amount of noise generated from that. There's a certain amount of, uh, a huge amount of um, burning tires um, that drifts across to, although it's an industrial estate, there is um, industrial, uh, sorry, residential estates nearby um, where the, 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 the smoke um, permeates into, you know, people in the summer, if they've got the windows open, etc. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of people um, who are finding it difficult to, to sleep because of the noise generated um, and also that, you know, the, just the smell is, is, is intolerable. Thank you. Linares, please. Thank you. I've got two questions. Do you want me to ask them both at the same time? Uh, by all means, ask them um, together, yeah. Right, one thank you very together. much. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly concerned about is, is when I read things like the unauthorised events are not subject to health and safety risk assessments and the organisers of these events appear not to wish to assume a full responsibility for ensuring the events are either safe or orderly. And I think it follows from that, does it not, that nobody there is insured. Um, by that I mean the people who are doing the car cruising, the people who are attending, should anything happen to them, and like a, 
an injury or any, anything like that, or even, well, even a death, probably, that nobody there is actually insured. And so there'd be no claims possible. And I just wondered whether that particular point is made pretty straight to the people who do attend these events, whether they realise it, because most people don't realise that sort of thing. And they think if, if they're damaged by somebody, that they will automatically get paid out by somebody. And I don't think that's the case here. I would like to hear from, from you whether that's something that we actually communicate, because I think it's terribly important. And of course, it may help you with my second question, which, which is about the role that business is having in helping to um, prevent or mitigate car cruising events, because they, need to, we, they would not want to think that they were getting themselves into situations in allowing events whereby it might go upon their insurance. So can you, can you please um, answer that for me? Thank you. Well, so in terms of um, the largest location for the meets um, is council land. It's a council uh, car park. So um, that, that would be the, the first business that needs to, to be thinking about their um, liability uh, in these things. Um, specifically, um, you know, just because we, we don't enforce, um, you know, are we, you know, uh, almost kind of giving um, giving permission for these these events to, to happen? We know that they happen on a regular basis. Um, they are widely um, advertised, um, and and yet that nothing is is done in regards to enforcing them. Certainly from the council side of things, um, and 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 minimally more so in terms of. Uh, the police because the, you know as far as they're concerned that the council car parks are not uh, public roads um and so it, it's less of a priority for them um in terms of the the, the insurance you're absolutely right you know you, you, most car uh, policies um <laughs> exclude um racing um i, I would also suggest that maybe a, a number of the, the cars are modified to a point where they're um where if they haven't um notified their insurance company of, of the fact that they've been motivated uh, be modified in that way then again yes their, their car insurance is is null and void um so yes that is a very real danger and i believe that there is a um you know for innocent bystanders there is uh, an industry um scheme that, that allows pay paying out for for people that are injured by uh, non-insured drivers um but but it's far from ideal absolutely far from ideal um we need to grasp this nettle is is the point uh, and we need to deal with it you want you want to come back councillor because yeah, I, I did see that there was mention as well that, that you have very sensibly i thought looked to see whether there was somewhere on a piece of our land where we could actually have a legal thing happen that was acceptable uh, but you haven't been able to find anywhere within the peterborough city council area um, is there any reason why we couldn't do something probably with Fenland or somebody like that who might have, as it were, flatter pieces of land and more open land than we have ourselves um, left in our local authority? So, um, so I, I think the, the, the trouble is that, as it stands at the moment, they, they, they turn up to, to, to the Pleasure Fair um, car park. Um, they're not challenged in any way. Um, they, 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 they have their meat. Um, they do what they want. They don't have to, f to fill in um, health and safety um, forms, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have to produce insurance for the event, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, until you close that avenue to them, why would they want to, um, to get involved in, in a, a load of paperwork uh, and a load of expense um, to, to do a, a, you know, a, a more legal, safer situation? Um, uh, they're quite happy doing what they're doing and, and th they're not being challenged on it is the, b is the bottom line. Um, the only way w that we would be able to encourage them to do so, um, to get involved in that, that you know, in, in a proper procedure, uh, would be to, 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 to close off every other avenue to them. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Allen has a related question, I believe. 
Yes, indeed. Thank you, Leader. Thanks for the opportunity. I mean, this does fall under my portfolio, but I haven't been directly involved in the Task and Finish Group or indeed uh, the preparation of the report. Uh, and as I see it, the issue is we are unable to implement closure of locations such as Fe Pleasure Fair and Meadows because they are public car parks. So the only way to stop this would be physical prevention, i.e. the police. Maybe a question for Ian. Do the police have any appetite for stopping these things occurring? Yeah. Thank you. It's a, a really good question. And one of, one of the things that we've spoken to the police about within our task and finish group, really. Um, the police aren't here to defend themselves, but what I know that they would say if they were here is, yes, they would have a lot of appetite for, for dealing with people who are breaking the law. However, these things often occur on Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, and the police work on a, a threat risk harm basis and have to cover a huge number of priorities across the city. And unfortunately, there are always high, or often higher priorities that engage the police's r limited resources, which means things like antisocial driving, nuisance though it is, does not feature as high on their radar for the resources they have available. Um, we've set out in our reports some options where we think the council and the police can work together to start to make this more difficult. Things like public um, protection orders around specific areas of land where we can work with the police, where we can perhaps get evidence from the police if they are going there from, from CCTV or, or, or um, body cams which we could then look to subsequently enforce post-event. So I think there are things that, that can be done. It, it does take a, a partnership approach. It's not something that the council can do on its own. And regrettably, the police just simply wouldn't have the resource to do what perhaps we would like them to do, given other priorities. Um, can I just add to that? Um, so this is why we, we have called upon the... Um, uh, Police and Crime Commissioner uh, to work closely with the um, Chief Constable to compile a report um, on how the, the, the police would want to um, tackle this issue. Um, as Ian rightly says, you know, that the, the, our police force are, are stretched in all directions. Um, I, th I think it's fair to say that everybody's fairly aware of that. Um, and um, it, it, this is not seen as a priority. Um, the, one of the reasons for that is the number of calls to service. Um, people are just fed up with just ringing up the police and, and complaining about this, uh, and then um, and then nothing happening. So they've stopped ringing. It doesn't mean that they're still, that, you know, that the annoyance has gone away. It doesn't mean that their their lives have stopped being affected. They've just given up on on ringing through to the police. There's, you know, there's. There are issues with the 101 um, call-in service um, with, with, with police, um, which I believe the, the, the Chief Constable is, sorry, the Crime Commissioner is trying to address, uh, and it's one of his priorities. I'm on the um, police and crime panel, so I'm, I'm maybe a little bit more aware of these things than, than maybe most. Um, but, you know, the, 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 these things are all interconnected is the point. Um, and uh, you know we need to, to work very closely with the police. I don't think it's it's a question of just saying this is a police issue and it's got nothing to do with the council. The council have its part to play. Um, there are things that could be done in terms of um, you know maybe ANPR cameras putting on the on the car park. I know there was uh, the, the, the you know we were looking to to maybe um, develop that car park. Um, so whether or not an investment in ANPR cameras on the because. Ultimately, you've got 500 cars turning up on a Friday night. You know, they're not paying car parking charges. Um, you know, there could be a considerable amount of revenue um, that, that comes out the back of this. Um, so, yeah. Um, thanks a lot. Conversation about the police on that, and I'm sure Daryl Preston will take an interest. But it should be noted that John Peach, who's the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner, is present today and will no doubt take this feedback he's hearing uh, back to. Police and Crown Commission, and indeed the Chief Constable. A couple of questions left. One is from Ishi, and one is from Marco, uh, and then that's the only people I have, really, because I think all the other points have been addressed. So, Ishi, do you want to ask um, your question? Yeah, Councillor Hogg, you mentioned about the impact on residents. Um, I just wanted to know whether the Task and Finish Group have spoken to the car cruise community and uh, what their views are about the impact they have on residents and businesses. 
Okay, so um, unsurprisingly, um, the car cruising community, um, uh, whilst they had been approached, um, were, were um, not really forthcoming in terms of um, engaging with the committee. Um, Councillor Howell, sorry, Councillor Stevenson um, has done a lot of work um, reaching out to um, the, these, um, these groups. Um, and I've spoken to the organiser of uh, at least one uh, of these groups um, to get some sort of background knowledge for the, um, so that, you know, that could be inputted into the, into the scheme. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it's far from ideal. The, the, you know, the fact is that they, they basically don't want to talk to us. Is, is the problem. Um, so, yes. Uh, thank you. And Councillor Chereste, then, finally. Uh, th thank you, Leader. Um, my first... Qu I've got three questions. Uh, my first question is, in the recommendation number six, um, you talk about Pleasure Fair Meadow Car Park. Absolutely fine. No problem with that recommendation. But why did you not include the Vivacity car park in Hampton. I declare an interest, it's my ward, and I also declare that it's just as, just as big a nuisance as it is a, a, in the Pleasure Fair. So, you know, I mean, you can answer that now or you can go so, and deal with it. So, uh, essentially, the, the, this is about <laughs> bolting on that car park to an existing PCSO, P, P, PSPO, uh, which is already in force in, in Woodston. Um, uh, and I, I, it, we have mentioned um, the in Hampton the report, area in, that, in, yeah. the, in the report. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure that it's as big a, a problem as it, it's, um, but still a significant problem nonetheless. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly, um, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, that it would be really good to get a maybe a Hampton um, councillor on the group. I believe that um, uh, Councillor Sainsbury is, is now coming off the, the group because of. Uh, cabinet responsibilities so it would be really nice to maybe see if we could get a Hampton uh, voice on that committee um, well, well I did offer was told that I couldn't join it because it, I was an executive member so. yeah no indeed anyway um, uh, the, my have, we got, have we got any councillors that, that are not on the on the cabinet uh, that are yes we can I'm sure we can sort of I'm sure that. put one together yes that would be really good okay my second question and you've already alluded to part of it is that, for example, if you want to park in Sainsbury's, uh, Waitrose, Beale's car park, there is a technology that reads your number plate when you drive in and reads your number plate when you drive out. So why don't we put parking overnight in the Fair Meadow car park at 100 quid a night, and we put the technology in and we find every single person that doesn't pay the 100 quid a night, 100 quid. That's 50,000 pound of income per night if there's 500 cars. I think it would go away very quickly. So can we have a look at that? Why we can't do that? You know, that's the, the, that's the question, is why can we not do that? You know? Uh, uh, I would uh, guess the, the answer would be capital expenditure well, of, uh, of that project. Technology is peanuts. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, to put that kind of technology in, it literally is peanuts. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, and we got Wi-Fi. Eventually, we'll have free Wi-Fi in the yeah. city centre uh, if we can ever get that organised. I, I would suggest it, it's slightly more than peanuts. Uh, oh, you know, it, it, it can cost a thousand pounds to put a drop curb in for your driveway. So, well, uh, putting in a, lo a load of technology and cameras and uh, having the, um, the the electricity to that point, etc. Um, civil engineering, you know, you can add two two two, two well, zeros well, to a figure that you think of. Instead of arguing what the price is. Why don't we find out what the cost is? Because that might be a solution. That might be a solution. Okay, th that's both questions in one. So thank you very much. I was expecting another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I think we've exercised that uh, somewhat. All options, you know, whether it's cameras or whatever it is, can can be discussed. Uh, but I, I, I'm actually going to say. Um, I don't think the problem is, is, is the car cruises or, or the car meets. I think it's the supervision of them or lack of it. Um, so for me, it can carry on where it is, but the behavior can't carry on. I'm just giving my two pennies worth. So it would actually be better if we invested some officer time in supervising the car meets so that they don't do the popping and banging and the wheel spins and everything else. Because if you move it from 
that car park, it's just going to go somewhere else. So is it not better to have a meet? Because I have no problem with these kids doing their cars. I think it's great. It's good to have a hobby. But the problem seems to be bad behavior uh, and noise and the other things. So if we charged a pound car parking fee for every car that turned up, it would pay for an officer or officers to supervise the event. And those that are found in breach would be banned from coming again because we would have their registration number. Just thinking out the box as Marco's favorite expression. Um, so that's another thing to consider for the chief executive. Is it worth charging a pound? Because presumably it's free at the moment. I don't know what the overnight rate is. And say, yeah, you're welcome to come, but you will be supervised. And if you are doing the things that are being complained about, the noise, the popping and banging, Councillor Hogg, as you're talking about, or wheel spins or whatever, um, then, then they would be asked to leave. Uh, and if we have some enforcement officers there with the powers to do so, it might be sensible. Unless anybody's got any final points, go on, Councillor Hogg. I, I just wanted to just sort of come back to you on that. The, the, the problem is that, that the, the car park concern is, is, is huge, as yeah. you well know. I know. Um, and um, you're basically faced with um, upwards of 500 cars. Uh, the, one of the reasons why the police, um, certainly at Stapleton Road, where you can get maybe 200 cars there, um, the, the, one of the problems is it is out of control as in there are too many um, people there for them to be able to safely police that situation without a major operation happening. Um, and I would be mindful of the fact of putting council officers into that kind of situation. Uh, it needs to be very well thought through to be able to, um, to organise these events. If, if we were to close down, and as you rightly say, that there is that danger of kind of um, like a dandelion effect that you, you kind of blow it and, and, and it, it just goes to the four winds and we could have pockets of, of but then they would at least be a lot more manageable um, and more importantly Peterborough is now seen as being an easy place to, to do this kind of activity specifically the, 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 the drifting so people will get in their cars and they will drive from, from, from Norfolk from, from uh, Lincolnshire from Hertfordshire from Essex to come to these meets because they know that there is a, a good chance of being able to just um, conduct their activity with, without any, any kind of um, robust, um, whereas if they thought that there was going to be the chance that the, the meat was going to be broken up, maybe they, wouldn't, maybe they would stay more locally and, and deal with the issues that they have uh, with maybe slightly more robust approach with the police in their own locale. Um, so I think that we do need to, we need to find something to crack this open uh, and then we need to have a long-term solution for, for keeping a lid on it, um, is the bottom line. There are many ways. My, my basic point is supervision, whether or not that's the police, whether it's council officers or whether it's security. For example, Peter United employ police. We could do the same if it was being paid for. Just saying. So there are many options to look at in terms of the basic point is supervision. If it's not supervised, people will do what they want. But if we try and disperse it, it'll just go somewhere else. And the problem will appear either in part or in whole somewhere else. Just some more thought for officers, really, because we are not, you know, we're not going there with our SIA badges on. OK, thank you. I'll take all the recommendations as read, uh, one to ten, uh, unless anybody has any, any objection to that. One sure. further point to make. And yep. So I, I, I'd like to thank um, Councillor um, Stevenson for her hard work of mm -hmm. uh, chairing um, this task and finish group. And I know that as a, um, an independent member, she's no longer eligible to go on a task and finish group. But I, I have to say that her experience and depth of knowledge on this subject is um, far and above um, better than anybody else on I'll, the group. I'll stop you because I have no problem with political proportionality not being applied to task yeah. and finish groups. So I would like to see if that... So if, if Councillor Stevenson wants to join it, I don't have any problem and I can't see anybody else would. Yeah. So okay. there, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't political proportionality should not apply yeah. in all circumstances to task and finish groups. So from my point of view, there's no reason why she can't stay on it. Thank you very much. Uh, if she's listening, by the way. 
Um, so we, we try to in, have an all-inclusive council here because we are very nice people. Are we not? <laughs> right. I expected a unanimous yes from my colleagues. <laughs> not, mm, let's think about that for a moment. <laughs> okay, so as I said, Pippa, items 1 to 10 will take uh, unanimously as read from Cabinet. I don't see any dissension to that. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Councillor Hogg and uh, Ian, for uh, your presentation uh, this morning. So while we just reset, if people want to move around for a second. Hopefully people can see what's going on. Just the next set of officers in place so we all know who they are. We shall move on to item number six this morning. The Towns Fund business cases are set out on pages 35 to 72. So the Towns Fund report is submitted to Cabinet this morning to request the delegation of authority to the monitoring officer, uh, director of resources and the section 151 officer, and the executive director of place and economy to uh, approve the Townsdale summary documents and submit them to the department for leveling up housing and communities for approval in line with our agreed towns fund program the towns deal board have endorsed the submission that we met just last week of these documents to DLUC, and that was on the 16th of june and confirm this again there are three projects that are before us today uh, representing an ask of six million pounds worth of funding of the total 22.9 million pounds request from DLUC for peterborough each of the three projects has had business cases completed and appraised by officers. The summary documents and monitoring and evaluation reports are appended to the Cabinet report for our attention this morning, as this falls within my portfolio remit, hence the short introduction summary uh, from me. But Karen and Charlotte Palmer will pick up the uh, reins from here. I don't know if you want to add any more comments by way of background or introduction. Karen, do you want to kick off? You might need to pull that towards you, by the way, uh, ladies and gents, that because the, the, the speakers aren't very loud if our tech team are listening uh, at the back there. They're not very loud in the room. So unless you've got the microphone here, uh, people will struggle to hear you. So uh, normally about six inches away. Okay. No, that That's was just really my helpful. techie talk. Sorry, it's my uh, background. But anyway, <laughs> fire away. And these are new to me, so thank you. No, that was a great introduction. Introduction. Thank you. Um, I think we have some slides, if it's possible to share those, to give some sort of flavour. I don't know who's sharing them. Okay, no problem. Unless they've got them over there, uh, no, uh, is the answer. Right, okay. We'll but just are, they these, are, are, are they these ones here with the... Um... They're very similar. Very similar. Okay. okay, I don't... Members will have had them in their packs, though, so if they've all got their devices... Uh, they'll know what you're talking about. If they haven't, they will get lines and stay behind after class after today's cabinet meeting. Okay, no problem, thank you. So thank you for the introduction. So um, just as a reminder, the Townsman Programme um, is an ask to government for the 22.9 million for a suite of eight projects. So across the whole programme, of those eight projects, um, four have already been submitted to government. We had two which were submitted, um, which we received funding for in 2021 and two which were submitted to government in April this year, which were pending approval on. So this is the next three projects we're putting forward. We'd like to share a summary with you today and put these forward to DLUC in July to apply for the funding, and the final one will go in the autumn. So all of these should go through the system in 2022. So the three projects today are um, the pedestrian bridge, which is an ask for £2 million, some improvements to Lincoln Road Public Realm, which is 2.5 million, and um, some accessibility improvements to Peterborough Station Quarter for 1.5 million. So a total of a six million pound ask. So in terms of the bridge, um, if you're a cyclist or a pedestrian um, going for the north or the south of the city, crossing over um, the Neen River, um, from a town centre perspective, your current offering is to walk across um, Town Bridge, 
which as we know is quite a busy bridge. So from a, um, a cyclist or pedestrian um, perspective, we would like to offer a new pedestrian bridge which will be located and link the two areas between Peterborough Embankment and Fletton Keys. So on the embankment side, we would have a link between the new university area, um, the quay, the Lido, access to um, a lot of the employment areas across to the Fletton Keys area. So it would be um, a lot safer from a walking and cycling perspective rather than going across the road. It would have access for all, so there'd be ramps on there as well, and it'd be an improved environment. Um, the actual design of the bridge which we've looked at is a cable stay design, so it's quite an iconic design with a very high height. So you'd be able to see it as quite a statement feature which people will be able to access across from north to south in the city. Um, so that funding request, as I say, is for the uh, two million. Am I losing my? Yeah, two million. Um, the total funding for the bridge, which is designed just to outline business case stage at this moment, is 6.2 million. The balance of that funding would come from Section 106, SIL, and some funding from the CPCA. So that's the first project I'd just like to give you a brief update on. The second one is um, some public realm improvements to Lincoln Road. Um, the improvements we're looking at are between Sargent Street and um, Windmill Street. So that stretch of road um, has a huge amount of the um, businesses on it. At the moment, if we think of the landscape there, we've got uneven pavements, we've got quite an absence of green space. Um, we've got littering problems, we've got a couple of parking issues. What we're looking to do is improve that public realm area to make it um, safer and improve a lot of the, um, the paving. So I would have liked to have shared a nice image of this with you today. Um, but if you can just sort of visualize looking down that stretch of area, we're looking at potentially looking at four sections of planting. So as you walk or cycle, you're in that area, you have a lot more greenery around you. Um, taking away and improving um, the pathways there with block paving, going from the roads to the shop frontages so it'd look a lot smarter. General public realm improvements like more bins, street furniture, um, two pedestrian crossings um, from the Lincoln Road, Alma Road junction so it's a lot safer. Um, we're also looking at two potential options around cycling, either having cycle lanes in or not having cycle lanes in and a community art installation project. All of these are at the design stage at the moment, so please take them with a hint of caution, and all of these will be taken to public consultation following your, if you're happy with this, um, and we'll be looking to do that public consultation in July. Um, so just as a reminder, that request into DLUC will be for funding for 2.5 million, the whole scheme is just shy of um, 3.4 million, and the balance of that funding will come from Highways Capital, SIL, and um, some smaller shared prosperity, shared prosperity bids. So the third and final project, just to talk you through, is um, focused around Peterborough Station Quarter. So at the moment, there's no accessible and level pedestrian cycle links between the city and um, the uh, the train station. So we're looking to put in a number of sort of small interventions to improve that. So um, one of the simple examples, if you go around the back of um, the yellow car park, if that's familiar to you, if you're going towards the Great Northern Hotel, if you're cycling around that area, there's quite a few nip points as you're cycling around there, we're looking to improve that. Um, if you're going down Bright Street, if you pitch yourself on a bike or on foot going down Bright Street towards the brewery tap in front of you, so the brewery tap's on the right-hand side, you would usually have to follow the road round to the right, go around the back of the brewery tap. We're looking at some interventions down there to improve the cycle access so it's safer and it's more direct into the station. So it's general improvements in the public realm. Um, one of the, the bigger interventions we'd be looking at is um, making sure we've got a better access into the shopping centre as well and link into the town. So at the moment it's just stepped access which leads from Bougie's Boulevard up into the shopping centre. We're looking at putting a large ramp in there so there'll be access 
you know, accessible on foot um, and disabled access as well. So the ask from um, DLUC for that will be for a £1.5 million um, towns fund allocation and any additional funds from um, uh, local growth match funding. So that's the three projects we'd like to um, ask for your support on, see if you're happy for us to proceed with that application to DLUC. Um, if there's any questions or anything I can add to that, um, please let me know. Thank you. Thanks. I hope you brought sandwiches because there's lots of questions on, on each of those sections. Um, so let's kick off with the first one, which I have is the, uh, the pedestrian bridge. Um, two or three questions on that kick off straight away. Uh, I'll take John Howard, Councillor Allen, and John Howard again, I think. Unless, John, you want to ask both your questions together. Is that okay? Thank you, Leader. Yeah, I'm going to blend some of my questions into one to make it a bit easier for you. Um, it was just to get a scale of the size of it and what the length and width of the bridge is going to be. And obviously, once it's in place, will there still be room for people to sort of come to the side of the bridge and enjoy the view? Thank you. Yep, thank you for that. So um, the current bridge design we're looking at has a span of 101 metres. So the river at that point is 67 metres. Um, it's all been designed in line with the, um, is it LTN 120? Yes. Which is the, the cyclist... Um, Act of travel. Act of travel. Thank you very much. So it's actually, at the moment, it's just over four metres wide. So there should be sufficient space um, for people who are travelling both directions. And of course, what I didn't mention earlier, you've just picked up on the views from that bridge as well. So from that bridge, you can look back onto the city and see the heights of the cathedral. Thank you. Councillor Allen, please. Yes, thank you, Leader. Uh, pop reference, I know money's too tight to mention, but we do want to get this right. Uh, it's an iconic uh, uh, bridge that we're going to put in that generations in the future will appreciate. Uh, so that's my point about getting it right. Uh, the link from the foot of the bridge, I've seen visualizations, but are we going to splay it out so that uh, it does cater for the university and indeed into the city? So that it's an obvious route from the city over to Flatton Keys and indeed traffic foot and cycle from the university will go to Fletton Keys. Uh, and oh, my follow-up to that is, will there be a delineation between pedestrian and cycle facilities? Because I know that's a trend now happening with footpaths, that rather than let them all bum around and beat each other up, particularly with scooters as well now in play, are we going to delineate the bridge so that one side is for cyclists and one side is for pedestrians? Thank you. Yeah, so I'll jump in and answer those if that's okay. Um, so first of all, in terms of how the pedestrian footbridge connects into either existing or new infrastructure, both on the embankment and the flat and keys side, um, all of that will come out as part of the detailed design stage. At this point in time, we don't have the specification for exactly how that will look on the embankment side. Um, the will, that will be subject to the wider embankment master plan works that are evolving and developing, um, but also subject to additional funding requirements in order to put that longer term connectivity in place. Um, however, we do have, we will, um, subject to the approval of Cabinet and DLUC, we will enter into a period of detailed design now where those sorts of details will start to emerge and we can look at how that will materialise um, what existing funding streams and potential future funding streams and developer contributions could be secured for that. And in terms of actually using the footbridge itself, in terms of the guidance, again, referring back to LTM 120, we will ensure the bridge is designed to meet that guidance. So well, as part of the detailed design, we'll be reviewing the best options in terms of shared space and making sure that that's designed and fulfills that criteria. And again, that will emerge and all be part of the public consultation process for the structure. Thank you. Anybody else on that particular project? No, nope. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, we should move on to the next one then, which I believe is the Lincoln Road uh, proposal. Uh, and again, I've got several questions in about that. We'll start with uh, Marco, please. I'm 
sorry, leader. I didn't know. We didn't hear what you said. But I said, I believe you have a question. According to my little yeah, sheet yeah, here, yeah, it's yeah. definitely you. You're it's not necessarily one. on any specific item. <laughs> but, uh, 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 you can uh, ask whatever question. You, you know, this is a free and yeah, open yeah. cabinet. It's just that I, I am, in a way, a little bit disappointed that one of the projects doesn't include the Midgate, Westgate, pedestrianisation and improvement, and. Uh, you know, uh, I would like to know where we are with that, if we are anywhere with that. Uh, and and we, do you have intentions, if we're not anywhere with it, do you have intentions to put it in as the next phase or something like that? Yeah, so I can update on that one. Um, as part of the annual budget setting process for the combined authority, we did submit a number of bids for funding for their next phase of investment, um, of which West Westgate and Midgate improvements were one of them. Um, and that, that was quite a high level overview at that point, um, mostly focusing on improving the public realm and traffic flows in that area. Unfortunately, that bid wasn't prioritised for the combined authority as part of the current budget setting process. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's off the table in the medium to long term but it does mean we need to do further work with them to identify the viability of that scheme and um, that said there are other funding sources that will become available to us over time for example the government as you'll be aware um, are, are increasingly funding in active travel schemes and there may be ways to again look at opportunities to improve active travel connections which by default will have an improvement to the public realm space as well um, but at this point in time that wasn't a scheme that the combined authority could fund and um, unfortunately it wasn't a scheme that was put forward at the time of the investment plan for the Towns Fund. Um, Lynn Ayres, please. Thank you. Um, you did mention we're going to have public consultations. Um, can I ask whether, with, um, I mean, they're, both, they're all three quite substantial schemes and mean a lot to the various people that are engaged in them. So I just wondered, are they all going to take place at the same time and in the same, same area or different times? and in different places. Can you explain to us how the public will get to know and be able to comment on it? Including me, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, that's a good question. So um, for the Lincoln Road, what we'd like to do is start the public consultation in July. Um, that will involve um, online uh, communications. It will involve face-to-face, -face, which will be happening on Lincoln Road. Um, we're looking at having a base there at different times of day as well to make sure we're capturing different parts of the community are working at different times of the day. Um, and of course, the ability to um, ask questions via email and send those questions in. Um, the public consultation for the bridge is due to take place in the autumn. I believe that's the second one which is intended to take place. Um, and that will be a very sort of similar approach in terms of the different ways and different mediums which the public and, and officers and yourselves will be able to find out details about what those proposals are and the bits which you know we can certainly pull into any sort of next steps of any design and the Peterborough Station Court will be after that so they won't be at the same time if that answers your question. And in relation to the last two I think you mentioned that you're going to have a place down in Lincoln Road are you going to have a place near the university or somewhere like that and, and another and a place where people can actually go to for the station quarter. I'll jump in for that. So you, I have to say you're one step ahead of us with the details for the consultation sorry. on Lincoln Road. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry, on the, on the River Benin Pedestrian Bridge and for um, the station quarter specifically when it comes in to ter into terms of the locations that we'll have because it's very key to us, of course, that we're in places that are relevant to the majority of people that will go on to use those facilities. Yeah. So we've got an overall plan for those two schemes, but the detail in terms of actual location hasn't yet been finalised. But we're going to have one. But we will definitely have Good. something in place and in terms of Lincoln Road as well just to add a little bit more detail to the consultation there because I went through with offices all of the plans for that on Friday and um, we have some great visualizations now of what that scheme could look like and um, we're also going to be doing some work um, with the ward councillors and hoping the ward councillors will support us in attending those events um, and the consultation questions and literature will be produced in the five most commonly spoken languages in that area of the city in order to ensure we can really interact with as many people as possible um, again, if, if anyone else has any suggestions or ideas for ways we could build on that consultation, we're more than happy, obviously, to incorporate that. Um, but Lincoln Road will go first, and it will run for about a month, effectively. Thank you. I have two more questions on this, one from John Howard and one from Councillor Hussein. But John first, and then Councillor Hussein. Thank you, Leader. And Nigel as well. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really good to see an ambitious project for Lincoln Road. So uh, well done for getting that in, in the proposals. Um, I was just wondering, what if the feedback on the public consultation comes back and doesn't favour the cycle lanes? Thank you. At this stage um, of the scheme, as you'd expect, we're very much in that the process of having different options available for people to consider. Um, and we were very keen to make sure that we're not presenting a, a fait accompli to, to people in the local community because we're very obviously interested as an authority to understand the views, but particularly the views of users of that infrastructure in the city. Um, so as, uh, um, as is standard process, we'll receive all of the, com the comments back as part of the consultation process and we will review those. And then after that, we'll move to a detailed design stage which will favour one or other option. Effectively what the council will need to do is consider the, 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 the um, advantages and disadvantages of either, either scheme and work out which one it's happy to progress with. It could be that there's an opportunity to incorporate elements of both, um, albeit the cycle lanes themselves. Um, it, would be, it would be quite difficult to do them with the road width that we have in any other way that's different to how they've been outlined at the moment. Um, one of the things we are also conscious of as well is that we are at the outline design stage for these schemes at the moment and once we have a selected preferred option we do need to take that through the standard um, road safety process that we do as part of any highway changes and what we might find when we do that is some of the options need need revising again in order to be able to meet the road safety requirements so this is the, the, the in summary this is an iterative process um, and if we get to a point where we're looking at a design that differs substantially from the favored design of course we'll enter into further consultation with residents and businesses as well Oh, Councillor Hussain, please. Thank you. Um, with the, um, the the bus depot that's on Lincoln Road, it does cause a lot of issues. So going forward, in, there is talks of potential moves in the future. So will the plan incorporate a design that would um, be adaptable if there's a move of the bus station and the f uh, bus depot in the future? And also, um, certain parts of that road have um, shops encroaching into the sort of public space. Um, does this design t take that into account and, you know, t t um, target those shops moving back out the uh, public, public sphere? Yeah, so if I take those questions in turn, firstly, the uh, stagecoach bus depot. Um, we, we are aware that that um, is a challenging infrastructure for this area of the city, and members will recall um, some time ago now, a motion was passed at full council um, to commit to looking at alternative locations for that bus depot. As part of the, the, the work undertaken on that, we have been working with the combined authority, and as part of their budget setting process, have secured um, some revenue funding in order to undertake a feasibility assessment of the various different options for relocating that facility um, and that is from not just in terms of where it might be suitable in the city and um, for that facility to be located but also what the finance model is that would sit behind that you'll all be aware the combined authority have the passenger transport powers now that previously sat with the local authority and um, they were also therefore considering the option of franchising the local bus network or aspects of it so in order to relocate a depot it's necessary to look at the different models of terms of ownership of a facility and does that make sense in the medium to longer term for that to be owned by a single operator or owned for example by the combined authority and be part of a contracted franchise um, as infrastructure for a local network to be provided from and um, so the, the, the long and short of it is that work has been undertaken now to look at what those options look like and um, with a preferred option to come forward which would then look at what the, those different financing models are and how that how the relevant stakeholders would invest in order to achieve that. In terms of the highway improvements right now in Lincoln Road, we're very conscious that that infrastructure could change, um, but any development that was to come forward on that site in the future would be required to have consequential improvements to the, the public realm, um, effectively for where that their land finishes and where it meets the current highway. So there would be requirements in place for the new developer of that site to be able to make sure that infrastructure ties in. So, yeah, we're very much looking at making sure they, they, we don't do one thing and then have to change it completely in the not-too-distant future. 
Um, and in terms of shop frontages, um, so you'll all be aware um, one of the challenges in this particular area of the city is that many of the individual shop units own the what effectively feels like the pavement outside of the front of the shop. Now, historically, it probably wouldn't have been pavement. It probably could have been front gardens, um, private property, but is now all opened up and people will use it as they would use a path. And um, people can have their, um, their, their goods and their produce out and available for sale. Um, in, in an ideal world, the council would just go in and in, put this intervention through on the highway that it owns. But of course, that would leave a very patchwork effect around the area with poor quality infrastructure. So our proposal as part of this scheme is to work with each of the individual property owners and undertake those improvement works on their behalf, subject to the legal um, um, requirements being in place. And then those shop owners continue to take on the long-term maintenance of that facility it does mean they can continue to have their goods their, their produce their tables and chairs etc out on that space but that is all considered to be an important element of that area of the community to encourage people to dwell longer and um, encourage people to therefore to the effect would be people sitting and being um, calmer in that space would have an, a consequential impact on the movement of vehicular traffic as well Thanks. Um, the bus depot and electrification of buses is very much on my agenda and is actually in the paperwork for the leaders' strategy meeting that's uh, coming up on Wednesday for discussion. So it is moving along. Our final question is from uh, Nigel Simons. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, we see we have a provision of two EV charging points. Can we be a bit more ambitious on that? We'll, we can certainly endeavour to be more ambitious. Um, of course, we are working within a funding envelope here, so what we need to ensure is that we're not exceeding the funding envelope available to us. One thing that we can um, and will very much bear in mind as part of this is looking at the underground connectivity for EV charging, the ideal scenario being that we enable further infrastructure to be installed later because the underground works are in place. Um, that will depend, obviously, on the location of the current utilities because even that will, could have excessive costs um, as part of that work, but that's certainly something we'll, we'll be looking to do. Okay, I don't think I missed anybody out there. That's going to take a great deal of cooperation from property owners to actually get agreement on all those properties to go right up to the boundaries. So I wish you well with that, and we'll see how that comes out. Finally, just a few questions on the other project, which is the station quarter, and I believe Councillor Oliver Sainsbury is first out the traps on this one. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask on the station quarter um, what the access improvement will mean for commuters actually going to and from the station and then the local residents who live nearby. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so there's a, there are sort of lots of small interventions we're looking at there and you sort of said specifically for the residents of the area. So um, just thinking out loud, thinking um, sort of north of Bright Street, that area there. So um, looking at those potential um, cycle improvements, which will put down Bright Street, which will be able to link people from, from the areas where they live uh, past the brewery tap across to, I keep using that brewery tap as a reference point, but it's quite a big, big thing there, just down towards the station. Um, also the better links with the better access from the bus station as well with the improvement of the ramps, which we already have in place. So um, they'll be on a, a, a more, steady incline so sort of safer and, and you know better for people in wheelchairs um cyclists and anyone sort of with push chairs or anything like that so and it's the realignment and improving those crossings and also looking at um better signage around the area as well to link people from the city and the areas where they live um to and from the railway station i hope that helps thank you councillor chester please Hello again. Um, how does this project link into the larger Peterborough Station Quarter project? So as some members will be aware, we are proposing to submit a levelling up round two funding bid to government on the 6th of July, um, subject to approval from the Combined Authority Board um, 
shortly. Um, that, that wider bid um, is for a package of work totalling around £50 million, um, which is improvements to the station itself and the passenger facilities, um, introducing a new western access and improving the, new, improving the current access from the eastern side of the station, amongst, amongst much more, many more elements. This particular element of the station quarter work is looking at improvements that will effectively be um, no regret improvements. So regardless of the finer detail of how those various elements of the station quarter come forward um, for the £50 million um, levelling up bid and ultimately a couple of hundred million pounds worth of regeneration in that area, these, these recommendations um, contained within this, this, this outline business case here are, are improvements that will improve people's day-to-day -day lives now, um, walking to and from the station, cycling to and from the station, um, making sure that journey is easier for them, um, more achievable to do on a day-to-day -day basis and more accessible for all users regardless of their physical ability. Um, so these measures are, are designed to be complementary of that, that longer term work. And uh, just something that you said earlier on about moving the um, uh, bus depot. Have you ever thought about putting it in uh, Fair Meadow? I mean, that would solve two problems with one, with, 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 you know, one blow, one stone, one arrow, whatever way you want to look at it. I, 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 just kind of blunt. I, I've thought of a lot of places the bus depot could go, to be honest, and a lot of them have different advantages for different reasons. So, for example, one of the locations we originally looked at would be um, sort of the town centre end of Maskew Avenue, um, because if we could, could locate there, would be obviously on very good highway infrastructure on Borges Boulevard. Um, but there was also the work that's been undertaken on the PIRI, the Peterborough Renewable Energy Infrastructure Project, and that was why, effectively, the scope of that project goes as far as Maskew Avenue, because if, if we could get our own electricity up to a new bus depot location and then we could power our own fleet, I mean, that obviously that just ticks so many boxes for everyone. Um, that has advantages of obviously not needing to cross the river and the rail as well. And, but there's, there's also opportunities around potentially in the Fengate area, um, around Pleasure Fair Meadow, and also in uh, North Breton as well. Um, this will become a, a, a task for us effectively when we identify the, the financial model behind the relocation. It will then compare to what opportunities of land are available at that point in time, either on the open market or assets that we have that we could utilise differently ourselves. Great. I think I got everybody there on that. Um, can't see any more questions and looking around. No? Okay. I think that um, very exciting times ahead with all this development going on. We are definitely open for business. So I'll refer you to the recommendations on page 35. If we're all agreed, it is only the um, opening statement and one thing to approve. So if we're all happy with that. Agreed. There we go. That that was easy. Thank you very much. Even though a lot of questions, it's uh, three great projects there. Um, so we'll move on to item seven. Uh, this is Councillor Howard's portfolio. I don't know if you've got anything by way of introduction, Councillor Howard, but I notice we've got Charlotte Black here. And is Tony here as well? Ah, there we go. He's hiding down the back over there. Just give a moment to reset the room. It's like It's like having a dance card, isn't it, when you a ball you're just kind of stepping up not that I remember those things but apparently you used to have lots of dances in the town hall Councillor Ayres will remember she's had two weddings here <laughs> what <laughs> yeah, indeed <laughs> across the road the angel yes long gone okay so it is the extension of the learning disability day opportunity contract uh, in Peterborough, you'll find the information before us this morning on pages 73 to 78. Councillor Howard, have you got anything by way of introduction? Thank you, Leader. Yeah, Oliver's going to take the lead on the presentation today, but just to give a bit of sense of the, the positive impact um, that this decision will, will have, I'll, I'll draw you to example 4.1 um, of a 21-year-old woman with learning disabilities who, through the through the um, provision is training up to, to actually look to apply for a job, um, which is making a massive difference in her life. So just to quantify some of the impact that this decision is making. But I'll hand over to Oliver for the main presentation. Sorry, Tony's going to take us through this. I'll, I'll just support with questions. 
Hi, this is Tony here. Um, so we're re requesting um, today if we can uh, get Cabinet approval to extend the contracts for the provision of three-day opportunities um, until the end of March 2024. And that will be for the providers Thera East Anglia, SENSE, which is the National Deaf, Blind and Rubella Association, and the Helping Hands Group. Um, this will ensure the continuation of day opportunity contracts and services whilst we undertake a wider commissioning exercise looking at day opportunities review in both Peterborough and Cambridgeshire. So we're requesting that we are um, extending the contracts to the 31st of March 2024. Thank you. I, I know I have two questions. I have no idea what the questions are. Uh, Councillor Hussein and Councillor Lynn Ayres. So uh, Lynn, you've been closest. Thank you very much. And beginning with A. <laughs> beginning with A. It's always good. <laughs> Um, I think this is really, really important for, the, for these people who, who obviously need all of this work that is going on. It's a very interesting uh, uh, thing that you're, you're doing here to extend this contract. And I see it makes an alternative offer to the City College as well. So you're, in other words, we're not just faced with one area for people. But um, what I wanted to ask was about the sort of co-production aspect of, of this and whether, whether that features within the Day Opportunities Transformation and how the Learning Disability Partnership Board will feature in that as well. So if you can give me... Yeah, that, that has already started, um, was part of that programme as well. So co-production is the involvement, engagement of um, wider stakeholders, particularly mm -hmm. families, service users, people who access the services as well, so they can feed into the design and the delivery of these services to make them really meaningful so that their outcomes are going to be the best for them. There's uh, today, my understanding that, you know, they've been engaging with key stakeholders from the very beginning. So you kind of start with a blank sheet so you can really develop that service as you go along and take people's views. So my understanding that they've already been co-designing and piloting an approach um, around outcome-based commissioning. So that's very much based oh. on the... Um, the benefits to the individual and what they will receive from that service as well. So day opportunities will also support families and carers. They will have a break from their caring opportunities, but also it's the meaning and the intent from what those people are actually going into here as well. So um, there's been co-production on that. There's been a lot of work going around visiting the services, speaking to people, um, looking at what they want to design going forward in the future. Um, and I understand it's more of like a com community-based care and support model as well so it's using the strength of what's already out there within the communities and building on that to support people so it's a real key feature of what we do councillor hussein please thank you uh, i've got two parts to my question um, this is uh, a high value contract and it would be good to understand the value for money so how does the service compare to city college in terms of number of people accessing the service and the cost of the service. And um, you've given a cost for breakdown in the paper. Can you confirm if this is inclusive of inflation? If not, what is the plan to manage that? Okay, so yeah, just starting with the, the numbers of people who access the services here. Uh, and bearing in mind, like with Sense and Thera and that, we've got extremely complex individuals. Um, so about deaf blind people, for example, so some of the most vulnerable people with the most complex needs. So these are very intensive services. Uh, we've, um, I think from last year, from what I can tell, we had about 86 people um, across those three services. So a bit of a breakdown. We had about 22 at cents and they go to the city college. They can go from anywhere to between one and, and five days per week. People often go on, on regular days. We've had about 40 people at Helping Hands. We've had um, in their 20s around 24 at Thera. So um, a good number of service users for whom it is kind of a lifeline for them and their families. Um, at the city college, which I, perhaps uh, some of their support is of a slightly different level um, and different varieties because we've got different centres like employment hubs. We've got the Brook Street College. We've got an industrial hub in Hampton. We've actually got about 250 people using that. So we can actually see the numbers of people across Peterborough who are going into the, and the variety and the range of support that we can give them across these different provisions is really important. Um, oh, sorry, and you're also, the second part of it was about uh, the value for money was that right about inflation yeah I think we'll get this to Oliver 
Yeah, thank you. So, um, so just if I could just skip back to the, the the value for money element. So, there's a number of service users that are accessing, um, in compared to City College, which is sort of an in-house service that's provided by the council, as opposed to the three uh, providers that act on the uh, the framework contract that we've just set out there. Um, this contract that we're looking to extend is just slightly over 1.2 million a year, um, as opposed to the City College contract, which is just over 1.7 million pounds a year. Now, there is a significant difference in the number of people that are accessing those services. So over 250 for uh, City College and under 100 um, for these framework providers. Now, there is a very, very clear difference in the needs um, that have been identified in the care and support plans for the people that access um, the providers that we're talking about today, as, as Tony has referred to. So it's it's not a comparison of, of like for like, but we can assure from the, the quality of services that we that we review and the outcomes um, based on annual reviews that the individuals who are accessing those services have, the outcomes that they're receiving are, are, are very good for the, for the services that they're, they're accessing. So we're very confident, actually, we are receiving good value for money as a local authority on these services. Services. The second part, so in short, inflation is not applied to, the, to this request, so to go for the lifetime of the contract, we're not looking to apply inflation. We would do that on a year-by-year -year basis, and we would do that as part of our business planning process within the council. So that's something we're looking at now for 23-24 uh, and onwards, but this is, a, this is not a, a figure that includes inflation. And the principle for that is inflation is varying so much at the moment. We know that recently in the, uh, the May figure, the Office of, Office of Budget Responsibility has set, has set the inflation figure for next year. So we just need to just refine that work within adult social care um, to understand what that means for us and the respective contracts. Thank you very much. I think that was the only questions I have noted on this item. So we will move to the recommendation uh, which is uh, page 73, you'll find them on, which is to approve the agreements for the provision of day opportunities to be extended until 31st March 2024 for the providers as listed at the amount listed also. We all agreed on that? Agreed, lovely, thanks. I just remind Cabinet we've got 20 odd minutes or so before we're due to finish, so questions is fine, but if we can keep them uh, short, that would be appreciated, so we can move on to our next meeting. Uh, we'll move on then to item eight, which is Lions Gardens extension to the 31st of the 10th, 23. Uh, and I believe that, again, this is John Howard, um, and indeed, no change in the front lineup also. So, uh, John, do you have any intro to this either? Thank you, Leader. I'll head straight over to Tony on this. Thank Hi. You. Okay, so we're requesting the contract with Herwood Care Services for Lions Gardens, which is um, adults with learning disability and autism residential service, which is based in Glinton near Peterborough. Um, and we are requesting an extension to this from the 1st of May 22 to the 31st of October 23. We're undertaking um, a wide ranging review of respite provisions, including residential respite in Peterborough and Cambridgeshire. And this will ensure that we align the outcomes from that review and have got the best models that we would um, put in place as of the 1st of November 2023. And the annual contract value is £787,125. 50% of this is funded by the CCG, which is a long-standing arrangement, and we have got confirmation of that for the um, extension period. Um, and for the 18 months extension, that's um, £1.18 million. Pounds. So we are requesting that uh, the cabinet Thank you very much. extension. Thank you, Tony. Um, questions? I've got a number of people. Oliver, uh, Nigel, Jackie, and Marco, if you want to... Oh, your question's already been answered, that's good. I'm glad to check. Uh, so it's Oliver, Nigel, and Jackie, I believe, in that order. Oh, Jackie doesn't need one either. Her question's been answered, good. So Oliver and Nigel. Thank you. Um, so co-producing services and engaging with the market is obviously important to ensure that we are, to ensure the services that the council commissions are meeting service users um, needs can you share with us how this feature how this will feature in the respite review work 
Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, we have already begun this area of work um, from the beginning of the review, so we ensure that co-production engagement with um, all stakeholders, including service users and their families, are built into the work. So as uh, we were at the data gathering stage, which has been taking place over the last six months, we've been um, also liaising with those communities. So we've been visiting providers, and we've been speaking to the staff that are there. We've been speaking to the people who use those services, with different sort of communication means, asking them what a good day looks like for them, what they hope to get out of um, the provision there. We've also undertaken, um, it's still open, we're about to close it, uh, a survey which has been um, put out online, been advertised by through social media, through our engagement partners, through our operational teams. And we've had a good level of response uh, to that to that survey, which looked at residential respite, but also at the wider respite as well, so we can feed in to the other kinds of services that would support with this. We've also um, been meeting and holding workshops with our sort of contracted um, engagement providers, so that's Pinpoint um, and Family Voice, uh, to ensure that we have the voice of parents and carers representing younger people coming through. We've also been working with VoiceAbility and Enabling Independence. And Enabling Independence is our Peterborough engagement partner, and that represents our communities and people who use services. So we've been asking them, and starting from the very beginning, what works, what, what's important to them in terms of the contracts and the services. And as we move into the next stage of options appraisals and developing from the findings um, of our engagement so far, and of our analysis will also be very inclusive of them going through that, making sure their voice is heard and they will be able to tailor services that best meet their needs. Thank you. Nigel, please. Yeah, thank you. You've referenced the services good quality. Can you qualify that, please? Okay, yep. So we have um, a contracts team. Um, and they would be flagging if there was any concerns around the quality of providers. They're not considered to be a provider of concern, but they do hold regular contract monitoring meetings. So look at um, elements that may contribute to quality or may impact on that. Obviously, under COVID, everyone's been struggling with their staffing, um, and this service is no different, but they're coming back more on an even keel at the moment. They've still been able to deliver consistent and good quality services throughout COVID, including planned and unplanned respite, where people have been hitting um, a bit of a brick wall sometimes in terms of mental health and services. As other services weren't there, they've had to pick up the slack. So the quality is very good there as well. Um, in terms of the CQC inspection, their, their main red, um, ratings inspection was October 2017, and they were good in all areas. So they're safe, they're well-led, uh, they're responsive, they're, they're caring, um, and all those people there in that service will get a good service. And also we've had responsive... Um, uh, inspections of a lot of care services in, in, in response to COVID. So in January this year, they also had a visit around infection control processes and procedures. They were looking at how the service was delivered, but also for visitors coming in. And we had assurance on those areas that they were fine and strong. There was, um, there was a, a qualified assurance in terms of the staffing because they've had staffing issues um, and obviously has impacted on the service. But all in all, um, we don't have any concerns about them as a provider. So that good thank you very much Tony so with no further questions I think we'll move to the recommendation uh, which you'll find on pages uh, 79 to 84 uh, and there are two recommendations one and two and we'll take those as read unless anybody has any objection Does that all agree thank you very much folks moving swiftly on to item 9 which is the a 1260 Neen Parkway Junction 3 improvement scheme design of active travel schemes. Um, I was expecting to see Charlotte there. Oh, but Lewis is here, so right. <laughs> Deputising, you, you, I was going to say, you look very much like Charlotte from a distance, <laughs> particularly with the beard. <laughs> I won't tell her that. <laughs> it's just my eyesight, Lewis, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Lewis Banks will be introducing this. I don't know if Adrian wants to say anything either. Or indeed, uh, Marco Celeste, do you want to say anything by way of introduction? No, okay, that's all right, that's fine. So, uh, Lewis, if you want to um, uh, just, as brief as you can, tell us what this is about, because I think we, most members will be fully up to date with this. 
Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. Morning, everyone. Um, so we've previously received funding from the combined authority to design an improvement scheme at Junction 3, which is the grade separated roundabout um, at the junction of Neen Parkway and Fletton Parkway, which obviously improved congestion at a busy junction. Uh, as part of the scheme, we want to make some walking and cycling improvements. So have been successful in securing an additional 165k uh, to design two active travel schemes. Uh, so they are a new footway on Melbourne Way and a new cycleway on Fortress Close and Fortress Way that will connect the existing cycleways in Hampton with the existing cycleways in Signet Business Park, which goes all the way to town. Um, so the intention is that we'll be submitting a full business case and detailed design to the combined authority uh, later this year to hopefully secure construction funding for the entire scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the second set of money really to be spent in that area with the junction widening as well, which is mm. what I was getting confused with earlier. Um, okay, so I think Marco and Lynn have a question. Uh, oh, no, Lynn doesn't have a question anymore, so Marco does. Uh, just very quickly, in the report that I got and the briefing, will you, somebody mentioned Serpentine Green. What's happening at Serpentine Green roundabout? Anything, or is that a, something different that we're doing? Uh, so that will be something different, the Serpentine Roundabout. Um, it's actually, well, there's, there's a couple of roundabouts they refer to as the Serpentine yeah. Roundabout. There's, um, we've got some um, early options, I think, for what people generally refer to as the McDonald's Roundabout there, looking yeah. at options there to improve congestion there. This, the main roundabout works, though, is, is Junction 3, so it's where the Serpentine meets the Fletton Parkway and the, yeah, the yeah. Neen Parkway. So that's where the, major, the future major scheme will be at that location. Yep. Okay. Okay, and can I ask one other question? Whilst you're looking at, at uh, 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 Junction uh, Roundabout 3, whatever you want to call it, do you realise that one of the biggest problems is getting out of Thorpe Road at peak times and slightly widening the splay at the entrance of Thorpe Road where, where it meets... Uh, yeah, is it the A47 there? Yeah. yeah, well, if, it is, you, you, if that was just to be widened, uh, you know, even half a dozen feet, that would enable two cars, one to go right and one to go left. And that doesn't happen at the moment. Yeah, so that's actually on site at the moment, looking at that's Junction 15 roundabout, and I believe there is intention to, to widen. They can't go too far back because there's no, utilities, but, but to just, widen, yeah, yeah, that section of Thought Road there just as you enter the roundabout. Thank you. Thanks. So I think that was it. Nobody else had anything on that. So we, we shall approve the recommendations on page 85. Uh, there's only one recommendation, we're all happy. Agreed with that, lovely, thank you. Thank you. Um, item number 10, hopefully this will be a very short item, um, which is the agreement to terminate the council's agreement with NPS, Peterborough Limited, in relation to property and estate, as detailed in pages 89 to 102. Uh, this is uh, Councillor Coles, but uh, he's on holiday right now, much deserved, no doubt. Uh, so uh, Cecilia Booth is here as the Section 151 officer and responsible also for finance. Do you have any comments to make uh, on this item, or we're just going to move on? Um, <laughs> <laughs> just very briefly, um, yep. MPS have been notified of our intention to give notice and I've been up to see the team as well so we're looking for a for an amicable um, exit of this contract thank you very much well the recommendation folks before us uh, is on page 97 um, and it's three items so again without reading them through you should have all read them you've got the papers in front of you um, I think that uh, obviously the time has come to reflect and um, do things in a different way, which is what basically this sets us on a path to do. So we all agreed with those recommendations? Agreed. That's, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to um, Opportunity Peterborough, which is on pages 103 to 106. Um, I think I do have uh, some notes by myself on this. Just bear with me a second. This comes under my portfolio, but I think, again, as we've been looking at all our relationships with um, 
different entities and businesses that we either control, have a share in, uh, we are now revising. And also, in actual fact, I view this as a very positive step in order to reinforce the Council's commitment to uh, regeneration and inward investment. Um, and I know uh, that uh, Tom Hennessy, who heads up OP, has been doing a great deal of work, and uh, we would look to be keeping him and other members of staff uh, that are currently working in, in, in OP if we reintegrate, that's the word, uh, our economic function back into the Council. Adrian Chapman, do you want to say anything on this? If I may, Leader, I'll be brief. I just want to echo exactly the point you made there. We've heard today of some really positive developments in the city, uh, towns fund, highways improvements, and so on. But there is so much more to do. And I see uh, the proposal that's before you today as a really important step forward in making it clear to developers and investors that the council is open for business. And this, if the proposal is agreed, um, that function of economic development and inward investment will sit as part of a trio of functions uh, alongside a chief planner role that I've brought in and also an assistant director for growth and regeneration uh, that I've also brought in and we'll start with this in a couple of weeks time so a really strengthened front line senior team able to engage proactively um, both with funders investors and uh, developers to uh, really bring uh, the city's aspirations forward at pace. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just <clears throat> discussing with the chief executive uh, about one of the uh, points in the recommendations. I think we can probably delete PIPA, which is the third bullet point. I don't think we need any further consultation or any formal decision. I think that can be made today. Um, so, go on, Matt. I think what I'm clarifying, there needs the consultation to happen, but you can delegate that authority for the executive director in consultation with the leader as your portfolio to, to, to take that further. So what I'm saying is you don't need a, probably a cabinet, a further no. cabinet report to make the formal authority. Happy to do that. We're all agreed with that. Bas basically, I think we can delete that, yes? In effect? Is that what we're saying? Or do you have a form of words? My suggestion was to delete it. Delete possible. it, fine. So, Pippa, if we can delete bullet point three, I don't think it's necessary. Any consultation will that would just be that from staff, I would imagine, and those that are affected by any integration. I don't think that we're may, planning to make any changes per se. Uh, what I would say on public record is that the staff and the team uh, have done a, a, a great job and they deserve more support from the council going forwards as to the roles that they will fulfill in the future. I would also like at this point to put on public record our grateful thanks to the board of Opportunity Peterborough for all the work that they've done over the years. And it is our intention to involve as many members of that uh, uh, limited company board in perhaps a future role with the council where they can assist, uh, where they can assist where they can assist um, uh, the team still uh, through the council directly rather than at arm's length through uh, a limited company. So we'll work through all the details and any consultation required, but we can delegate that cabinet to the officers to determine. That's what we're basically saying, is that okay? And everything else stands there. So I, uh, bullet points one, two, and four, but, but, I, but I don't think um, we need to bring anything back to cabinet. All happy? Are you happy on my left here? Yes, Marco. Thank you. Um, I mean, one of the things that OP has been really, really good at is engaging the Peterborough business community. And certainly in the early years, it's one of the things that made it highly successful. Of course, you know, I'd like to take the credit for being partially responsible for setting it up. You can have the full credit. All right, well, we don't I, mind. I will then, thank you. I will have it all. But anyway, but whatever. Uh, but I would like, whatever we do and whatever happens and whatever recommendation comes back to us, I would stress that I think if we want it to succeed, we need to make sure that the Peterborough business community is still highly engaged in its future and in the work that it does. I think we're saying the same things. That's what I've just alluded to. But the team need to work out the structure and the details of that, whether that's, quote, a business board or some other 
uh, uh, shall we say, group of people, how we bring them together. You're right, I don't think we want to lose that expertise or that local connection to business uh, through the council directly because we've had some very, very good people uh, that are on the board today and that have been on the board in the past and I think we owe them a, 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 a debt of gratitude which we just acknowledge and will go on public record. So I think the process of how we, how we reintegrate our economic functions back into the council, we can leave to the chief exec and the team uh, to work that out with the team OP who will no doubt all be stupid uh, directly into the council on salary. There are a few little things to work out, but that is just business, as it were, as usual. So the implication of what we're doing is to strengthen our economic uh, uh, development and delivery rather than diminish it, uh, which probably at the moment it's probably been a little lacking in love and attention. All agreed? Great, lovely. All right, so it's all those... Um, it's all those bar bullet point three, which we struck that out, and we didn't get any query on that from the team. So other than that, we're fine. Um, okay, we're moving to the home stretch. Um, budget control final outturn report, 21-22, pages 107 to 150. Councillor Coles, again, I'll repeat, because he's probably watching, <laughs> is on holiday. Um, so lucky old him. So Cecilia Booth, uh, and I don't see Kirsty, so... Um, Cecilia, do you want to say anything about this in terms of how it relates to the recommendations or anything you want to highlight? Um, no. Put there's the thing near your... Um... There's nothing in particular I want to highlight. I think members have seen this report already and the detail of it. Uh, the final outturn position is that we have an underspend of four and a half million. So the, the overall position has shifted quite significantly uh, over the last six months of the financial year. So, so the breakdown is in the report and is self-explanatory. I'm happy to take questions, but there's no... Uh, just one second. Just make sure. Um, I think uh, Matt wants to come in. Yeah. Just to follow on from Cecilia's comment there, I just think a formal note of thanks to the staff managers who mm. worked damn hard to deliver this. I think it's a significant improvement that's down to the hard work for you as councillors as well making some tough decisions and I think we have got a lot of external scrutiny this has been well received by various audiences and I think I think it's no mean feat to deliver such a significant shift in terms of the spend position compared to where we were a few months back so I think the message is we need to keep the moratorium in place with some checks and balances so we're not out of the woods as you, you'd have seen in other reports but I think it's an extremely positive picture somewhat masked by some of the COVID funding and the sort of extra bits and pieces from government through the year and we were still in a you know, high-blown COVID situation for quite a bit of last year but it's a very good position and a healthy position than what we had before so I just want to echo I know comms have got it on board to through the staff conversations to give that formal note of thanks to staff as well. Thank you. Indeed, and I would echo that and all the hard work from the cabinet team as well in terms of uh, steering the ship. We've made good progress. As I reported today, press releases have gone out. I did a piece this morning uh, on the BBC that talks about we're not out the woods yet, we all know that, but in, it's remarkable the progress we've made in terms of particularly on the 17 million pounds worth of savings over 50 percent just after two months but yes the pressure is still on i would also like to say on public record i'm sure cecilia would echo that we've made uh, a saving in the year ended not in the current year people seem to be misunderstanding that it's something in this year and they also seem to think that we've got money to spend whereas we don't have money to spend because our reserves position is 16 percent of what it should be in terms of 46% on average for our revenue spend. So the money has gone back into reserves because we are facing anywhere between five and 15 million in terms of our opening balance for the forthcoming year. So people who think we can spend it on other things are mistaken because we are a long way from financial sustainability. I hope you would echo those comments. I'm getting a nod. Uh, so grateful thanks to all the team for the hard work. The recommendations are as printed on page 107, and it's items one to six. If we're agreed unanimously on all those, we can take them on block, yes? I think that is good. So, Pippa, um, on the last item, uh, the outcome of petitions, 
uh, pages 151 um, to uh, 156. They're just for noting, really, are they not? Unless anybody's got any questions on, either, on, on uh, any of those. I won't, I won't go through them all. Um, I think probably uh, some of them are out of date in any event that we have moved on. And with that, I think I'll call the meeting uh, to a close, uh, at item 13. Um, and thank you all very much for attending this morning. And we are one minute past 12, which had I not waffled on for a minute, we would have been on time. So thank you all very much.